Remember when playing tabletop games was for nerds? We're living in a beautiful redemption arc where tabletop games are now some of the most popular media to not only play, but also enjoy as audiences. We can watch amazing players on live streams or as serialized episodes. They even have seasons for their campaigns. Letting audiences follow exciting stories either from a fresh start or meeting up with old friends. There's a particular campaign that's become a gold standard in engaging tabletop gaming production. Critical Role is a series produced by professional actors who took their own personal game and broadcasted it out to the world. Their charismatic yet down-to-earth approach to gameplay creates a balance of levity and sincerity. So when their fan base, affectionately known as Critters, answered the call for crowdfunding an animated series based off of their original campaign, they accumulated over $11 million, with more than 80,000 backers. Did the animated series prove to be an effective adaptation? Welcome to Workshopping Stories Adaptations. And just as a warning, there will be spoilers. In this episode, we'll be discussing how the Legend of Vox Machina managed to capture the magic of the original campaign while still adhering to effective storytelling. The main cast of heroes is extensive. Yet like any good storytellers, the players and their campaign manager, Matt Mercer, have allowed their characters to flourish. And the main story doesn't get left behind, nor do the characters feel one-dimensional. This balance helps maintain interesting plot points with important teases of more, more for each character, and more for the adventures to be had. The premise of the first season's arc already had heavy lifting to do. After years of developing lore, the producers of the adaptation needed to make sure the layers of world and character building supported the essence of the original campaign. While we can glean a fair amount of external information that may be informed by internal traits, there are still other ways to explore what makes a character tick. And one of the best demonstrations of this is through the first season. Season 1 focuses heavily on the Briarwood campaign. As such, the main focal point for character study lies with the hero uh, Percival Frederick Stein von Musikowski de Rolo III. Percy. On paper, Percy is described as a human gunslinger of noble birth, and he reflects his pedigree with articulate communication, impeccable dress, and clever machinations. Yet the sharpness of his cold exterior is not only attributed to his aristocratic upbringing. He becomes engulfed in mysterious smoke, signaling his murderous intent. He dons a menacing plague mask. His voice drops to a gravelly, inhuman octave. But how did he get to this point? Percy has suffered unimaginably. And the way he's managed to cope and adapt is not only to protect himself, but also to avenge his fallen loved ones. For Percy, his solution to healing is only found in revenge. And it's his only reason for survival. To have everything he knew ripped away from him so viciously would be traumatic for anyone. Yet there's a fascinating juxtaposition to Percy that his player and voice actor, Taliesin Jaffe, taps into. Many scholars in the field of psychology and sociology discuss the dichotomy of humans and how it impacts our relationships with ourselves, each other, and the world. Percy has very specific appearances he puts out to the world, as a cool, distant figure who's two steps ahead of the rest. We're lucky when we get to see some softer inclinations of his. He can be too deadpan when keeping up with his more relaxed companions. His prestigious lineage and upbringing can interfere with his ability to relate well to those of more common backgrounds. Where his short responses can grind on patience, this somewhat naive self-perceived proficiency in dealing with people can be endearing. We're able to piece out what he wants to be as well as parts of himself that may not align with his meticulously crafted presentation. But that facade is quick to crack, once we get a glimpse of those who lit the flames of vengeance in his soul. The Briarwoods are a husband and wife who usurped Percy's family from their lordship over the city of Whitestone. They are cruel and merciless. All of their actions are self-serving. In a way, they represent the possible end that Percy might be going towards should he allow his one-track desire to overtake him completely. Lady Briarwood is willing to sacrifice everything for favor with an ancient entity to protect her husband. 
in taking the steps to preserve their power and longevity, Lady Briarwood has also forsaken their humanity. And as Percy takes each step closer to enacting his revenge on the Briarwoods, we're fearful that he's allowing his own humanity to be chipped away by his designs and the manipulations of something else. The weapon he wields is something created by his own hands. And it's an amazing point in storytelling that the names of those whom he seeks revenge against have their names emblazoned on each barrel. With each target he's killed, their name is erased from his pistol. Such a design isn't one of human engineering. But it also indicates how far Percy has gone, and plans to go, on his quest for revenge. From a logistical standpoint, it also sets up roughly how many opponents Percy will face off against before the end of his journey. With Stonefell, it's his relentless and unquenchable brutality. For Anders, it's Percy's guilt over trusting an untrustworthy man. And Ripley, whose carefree cruelty was due to their self-proclaimed desire for knowledge while under the sponsorship of the Briarwoods. Of course, this list includes the two Briarwoods. Ominously, there's one chamber left, nameless and Percy knows who it's for. However, during these battles and encounters, we see multiple times how Percy's rage can turn against his comrades. There are instances where his friends are moments from death by his hand. He appears to know what's happening, but there's a strange distance from what he verbalizes to what actually happens. It's not the same shadow and persona as described by Carl Jung, the shadow each person has of themselves that they keep from the world, and the persona we express and present to society. Even if it was born from homicidal intent, there's something that's distinctly not Percy. Again, the parallels between Percy and Lady Briarwood are on similar tracks. One more willing and cognizant in their ruthless pursuit, in the name of a fearsome god, the other consumed by rage and their own self-loathing under the patronage of a nameless demon and Lady Briarwood recognizes this struggle within Percy, and she uses it against him. She knows that Percy is handling complex feelings, survivor's guilt, betrayal, fear, anger. It's a volatile cocktail that may drive him to a vicious success, but more likely a climax where he crashes and burns as his feelings spiral out of control. Neither of his two halves, that he presents to the world, and that he keeps only known to himself, have reconciled with each other. There's still distinct parts that cause strife and obscure his ability to make decisions that don't further complicate his situation. But Lady Briarwood doesn't fare much better in her decision-making. We see it in her frantic readjustments of plans. It may seem like she has reconciled her shadow and her persona. She acts in ways that truly only benefits her and her husband, even in ways that alienate her own followers. But there is a shadow she refuses to unveil to the world. That of a desperate, fearful soul. Two people of nobility and high standing viciously clawing their way to survival. This reflection of the hero and the villain is what makes following their paths that much more tantalizing. They're both submitting to a will, both of their own doing. Yet they are also swayed by forces outside of their own locus of control. Both the protagonist and antagonist are working under these influences, with the purpose of setting things right. Both allowing their anguish to be weaponized against them, and doing very little, if nothing at all, to resist. Percy's saving grace doesn't come from his band of mercenaries, at first. Instead, there's a glimpse into hope when we find that Percy's last living relative, his sister Cassandra, survived their escape attempt. Percy tenuously maintains his humanity through his relationships with his comrades and the memories of his family. His enemies are reflections of his perception of failures, and that's what keeps his characterization dynamic with each sequence we find him getting closer to the Briarwoods. The Briarwoods' lackeys provide obstacles to Percy's ability to take his revenge, but they inevitably set up a path for Percy's redemption. Percy's revenge isn't just at stake. The lives and safety of the people his family protected and had lordship over are now suffering under the tyranny of the Briarwoods. The Briarwoods have underestimated Percy's underlying character, that there's still a sense of goodwill to others. He's still dead set on his revenge, but he does take time to help those of Whitestone. In failing to recognize this in Percy, 
The Briarwoods then have to inflict some of the worst assaults yet to set him off course. Through his sister. As much as Percy is dealing with his trauma, his sister is also obviously scarred from her experiences. She's managed to live under the Briarwoods since their escape attempt. But she seems distant. Not the same sort of distant that Percy actively maintains by keeping others at arm's length. Cassandra looks like she's unsure of who she is, as if she's uncomfortable in her own skin. Her design reflects this, an amalgamation of Briarwood and Dorolo. Percy only seems to truly soften and expose his humanity when he sees her again, but it doesn't erase Cassandra's hollow demeanor. It's only when we see her name appear on Percy's gun that we realize she's simply been bait and has betrayed her brother. And Percy, seemingly weakened by love for his sister, fell directly into the Briarwood's trap. What makes the betrayal that much more intense is the question of how much of it is mystical influence. We've seen countless times how the Briarwoods use their supernatural abilities to control the actions of their victims. But so much of what Cassandra says to Percy rings more true to a hurting, betrayed loved one than someone who is simply being mind-controlled. We see this come to fruition during the final battle. Percy is battling his demonic bloodlust set on revenge, while his sister brutally attacks him. It's true that she's still under some sort of spell, but there are serious considerations as to why she'd have these feelings to the Briarwoods, the world, and her own brother. As the fighting ensues, Lady Briarwood is ready to bring the world down to maintain the security she has built for her and her husband. But it's something that Percy has that the Briarwoods do not. He's surrounded by people who care for him and are willing to do what's right, not just by him, but for the world. Eventually, Cassandra is freed of her curse, but it's obvious she and Percy have more healing to do, and they decide to find their healing on their own paths, though now they have a better understanding of each other. Lady Briarwood's path diverts completely from the triumph of Percy. Percy, with the aid of his friends, is able to release himself from the hold of the demon. Cassandra is able to do the same. Yet Lady Briarwood is left completely alone. At the end of it all, she and Percy were so close to validating their meaning of survival. But Percy chooses a different path, to burn his designs for revenge, ultimately finding new meaning for survival, and setting things right. Unlike Percy, Lady Briarwood maintained course on her path of self-destruction. Her methods of survival ultimately proved to be meaningless. Despite treading similar paths, Percy comes to a realization at the end of his journey. His realization seems to be one of hope. After shedding the vestiges of a vengeful demon, Percy might be closer to consolidating the two parts of himself. The one out for a primal revenge to atone for the cruel fate that befell his family, and the one who understands that there are still things in life worth embracing and protecting. Thank you for watching this episode of Workshopping Stories Adaptations. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like. Who's your tabletop character? Even if they're just an idea right now, we'd love to hear about it in the comments. We'll be responding to some comments in a Workshopping Stories discussing adaptations video. Thanks again for watching. <laughs>